Yeah. Yeah, typically people of because it's Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from whichever part of the world that you're watching from. And welcome to this talk show here at the World Water Week, which will be all about the margins to the center, bridging borders for SDG 6. It's so lovely that you're tuning in with us here, whether it's online from home or whether you're here with us in the room in Stockholm. We're very delighted to have you here with us today. Now, my name is Hajia Goubi. I am a former United Nations Youth Representative for the Netherlands, but above all, I am honored to be your moderator for this talk show today. And not the least of which, because the topic of it crosses into such a fundamental element within the challenges that we have with regards to making sure that we, that we reach the goals by 2030 for SDG 6, amongst others. So today we're diving into how the Center for Advocacy and Research is advancing clean water and sanitation for all, particularly in marginalized informal settlements of, uh, of Baba Nushwar and Jaipur that we'll be diving deeper into specifically today. We'll explore how they are bridging the gaps between communities, policy makers, service providers, government, to really make, sh make sure that we can make SDG 6 a reality especially since the 2030 deadlines are looming and we are still facing the threat of this imminent climate crisis that we're in. So that's a very important topic to discuss today and I am very honored and delighted that I have an expert here with me to help guide us through that conversation. So it is really my pleasure to welcome to the stage here with me today, first of all, the Executive Director at the Center for Advocacy and Research uh, from India, uh, Akila Sivadas. We're so happy to have you here with us. Thank you. Akila, um, I, I mentioned the uh, I mentioned Baba Nushwar and Jaipur in the introduction, as those are the specific communities that we'll be diving deeper into for these next 20 minutes. But just maybe to get a, a bit of a general sense of understanding, why are we looking at those communities specifically? Uh, specifically, can you tell us a bit more about the the context of them? Firstly, thank you very much, and what a wonderful introduction. And I'm very happy to be here on this occasion, World mm. Water Week, and particularly talk about from the margins to the center, because right. now that's absolutely essential to you know, reach our targets of SDG 6. Mm. Uh, why are we talking about Bhubaneswar and Jaipur? Mm -hmm. uh, well, if we you know, had to s capture that in a couple of words, we'd say, you know, people are thank you know, due to climate change, but even prior to climate change, yeah. you know, what we call, you know, predetermined conditions, uh, they are facing intense privation and hardship. Mm. They're not only bogged down by poverty, but a lot of, you know, indignities and extreme squalor. You know, that's something that is, uh, you know, difficult to imagine. If you had seen Slumdog Millionaire, yeah. you would have got some idea of what Danny Boyle, you know, showed on that, one of mm. the biggest slums of Asia. Mm. Dharavi in Mumbai, in Bombay. Right. That's actually capturing it. And, you know, and the kind of shocks they go through. The recent pandemic is one big example. They've been left bereft and probably pushed back by 20 years. Mm. Whatever the little gains they made, just pushed back on every front. And the adverse weather events, both in Bhubaneswar and in Jaipur. Bhubaneswar yeah. is a coastal town, mm -hmm. and all coastal you know, areas are under immediate threat. As early as 2050, mm -hmm. it's estimated that all of them are going to be submerged. And you know, they're going to face huge problems. It's a new town. It actually grew out of a super cyclone. Yeah. You know, and uh, learned from that experience, and has built around it, and it has a huge indigenous population. Mm. So that is one part of it. And Rajasthan, is, which is where Jaipur is, one of the capitals, very drought prone. It's the desert. And the desertification is you know, increasing. Right. But what is important in all of this is the face of the you know, suffering or the face of the deprivation. And right. that's women, largely women. Mm. And all the connected groups, persons with disabilities, transgenders, diverse genders, elderly, the whole huge swath of what we call, you know, scheduled caste, that is less privileged caste yeah. and indigenous population. Yeah. But I'd like to just end by saying that, you know, there's a lot of hope in these populations because they have huge resilience mm -hmm. and are very resourceful in crisis. Yeah. You know, they're all the time prepared. 
I, I you know, for crisis. I so. love how you say that because it's like when I listen to you speak and on the one hand, when we talk about resilience, there's this the side of it where you see the the almost like mentality resilience, the the innovativeness, people that bounce back, you know, after every crisis and everything that happens, that takes strength, it takes determination. On the other hand, you're also, you know, showing very clearly with what you're explaining that, you know, when a pandemic hits, setting communities back, when uh, weather events hit, it sets them back. And that is also this different sort of like systemic resilience that requires proper, as you say, moving from the margins to, to the center. center. How do we ensure that we that we get resources in place? So, so, so when you say that, if we if we look at at you know um, um, the needs also of urban poor communities, but then specifically also the fact that they are so resilient and that they have a lot of insight and on the ground wisdom and experience to bring to the table. How do we make sure that we also make them a part of the solution when it comes to you know, promoting social equity and also these specific cases? So, uh, no, uh, you know, you've actually hit the nail on the head hmm. because this is all about what we call the double-edged effect. The double-edged? You know, oh, when everything's going well, yeah. they're very easily forgotten. Right. You know, and there's a sense of, you hmm. know, shall we say... Yeah. Even arrogance, arrogance even over nature, arrogance over people. Yeah. But when the going gets tough, yeah. they're on their knees and they know that it's only the people that can actually, you know, come to everybody's sort of, you know, salvage the yeah. situation. And this is no different, mm. you know. And one of the things that happened during the pandemic was the urban poor actually decided to walk back. And we saw this colossal phenomena called reverse migration. Mm. They just started saying bye-bye to the cities and walking back. 3,000, 5,000 miles they walked back. They cycled back with their children. Wow. You know, and they made a very powerful testimony. Mm. And we, people had to go down on their knees and say, please come back. There's nothing we can do with you. Your, uh, uh, in the urban areas, your informal work and workers are contributing 85 percent. 85 percent. Wow. And if you look at the you know national portal yeah. where they're registering the unorganized workers, there's something like 50 percent are women. Yeah. So you can imagine they're at the, shall we say, at the you know, cutting edge. You can't get any closer. Yeah. And so you know the realization is there that mm. you can't do without them. Right. You know. And uh, you, there's also a lot of camera, there's a lot of TV, there's a lot of, you know, media. You know, it's, there's nothing you can hide. There's no closets. You yeah. know, when we have big conferences and dignitaries coming from all over the world, they even sort of somewhere, you know, try to camouflage yeah. the, you know, the grim side of the city. Right. But that's not possible. Not you know, that's all yet. over, you yeah. know. Today you're on real time you're communicating. Right, you see everything. So, you know, it, it, now they realize that yeah. it's important. So, you know, uh, that's one thing I want to underscore. Yeah. That there's no denial about, you know, urban poverty. But then, but then when you say that, that there's no denial and it's, it, you know, there's no hiding in plain sight, so to say, um, the powerful testimony indeed of, of people moving back to, as you said, reverse migrating to the local communities where they came from, then the cities realizing 85% is a striking number, The how crucial they are to the functioning of cities. Why, if we take all of that into account, why is then still the case that, you know, these urban poor communities are, are not as, as, as included and integrated into city planning and development yeah. as they should be? Yeah. So, you know, th um, I think there are what we call both structural, Mm -hmm. which is even beyond the control of a system, right. in all fairness. Yeah. It's not that the system is one big villain, mm -hmm. you know, and the communities, yeah. it's not like that. Yeah. There are structural impediments. You know, if you take something like skill, if you take something like literacy, mm -hmm. if you take something like, you know, women's empowerment or women's, you know, s position or status, yeah. there are, you know, shall we say, entrenched inequities. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it hasn't come since India became independent, it's been there for centuries. Yeah. So you are fighting that. Hmm. Therefore, people like us who are not within the system, but can ha but have a you know re re ongoing relationship with the system, are constantly influencing them. Hmm. You know to look at look at it through new lens, hmm. and communities bring a lot of strength. 
Yeah. You know, they bring not only strength of numbers, but they bring strength of concern and care. Hmm. Because they know what it is to feel deprived. They're, you know, e their emotional quotient right. is very, very high. Yeah. And that's time and again, you know, demonstrated. Hmm. So the point is to find the pathway to integrate them. Hmm. You know, orient them, skill yeah. them, train them, empower them. Yeah. Put them at the center. Never work for them or by them. Let it be of them, by yeah. them, for them. Play the role of a quiet fa facilitator. Steer it as quietly as possible. Yeah. You know, without you know drawing attention to yourself. Yeah. Because finally, the person on the last person on the block is actually responsible for yeah. everything that goes on. That's yeah. the principle of any work. Yeah. You know, the, the minute you leave the office, you're out. Yeah. The person who's there handles it. You know, yeah. you don't you don't take that proprietal in, interest outside. So I think that level of confidence and trust we have to build. Yeah. You know, and Together. it has to be demonstrated. You yeah. know, there is no quick fix to do it right for all this. Yeah. yeah. But I love what you say. At the core of it is that you don't do it for them. You do it. You let you let they them do it, do it by them, by yes. themselves. And we do it in large numbers. We don't create coteries. Right. We don't create again. You know, a set of people that empower themselves over the people. Yeah. All that we have. You know. So, so, so maybe can we can we get uh, zoom in on that a little bit? Because when you say sort of that it needs to be community led, and when we look at community led wash projects, can you just share a little bit more with us also what the role of data is? How do you use data to sort of guide these community led wash projects? Yeah. So when we say community led, right? You know, there are. It doesn't mean that there is no professional involvement, or mm -hmm. that there is no expertise, or yeah. there is no technical. You know, it's not that kind of, you know, romanticizing that is, you know, community led. Yeah. But they are, when you are actually in a real situation mm -hmm. and you're trying to transform the real situation and you begin at the beginning, you don't join midstream. Mm -hmm. You start something at the beginning. And that's the advantage we have, with, you know, in the context like ours. Yeah. For instance, urban sanitation doesn't exist, mm -hmm. didn't exist for yeah. the poor at all. Yeah. I mean, that's the first thing mm -hmm. that is, you know, compromised. Then everything else follows. All the yeah. deprivations, all the, you know, whatever, uh, violations at the human rights level follow. Yeah. So when we began, we actually began, you know, large part of it was like the poor reimagining that, you know, part. They mm -hmm. didn't join midstream. Right. So everything from laying a pipeline mm -hmm. to, you know, getting water tested to yeah. actually working out ways of conserving it. Yeah. To all of that was, you know, then captured at the data level. Right. You know? Yeah. I was just telling Justin yesterday that if you step, you stand outside a slum mm -hmm. and say, take a guess how many people are there inside, you will with great, you know, hesitation say 300 or 400. Mm -hmm. But when you step in, there'll be 7,000 people. Wow. You know, it defies human imagination. Yeah. So they have to come in. They mm. have to tell you exactly how many people yeah. who uh, within that, yeah. what is the hierarchy of the most excluded? Yeah. What is their kind of you know, condition? What are they compromising? Yeah. You know? And at, in a day and age like this, you know, there's no way that you yeah. know, we can be, shall we say, you know, uh, blasé about it or not be indifferent or apathetic to it. Yeah, because exactly. it will come back to bite you. Yeah, you know, will. the yeah. pandemic showed it very clearly. Yeah. You know, nobody was spared. Yeah. The mosquito is not going to spare you. Any of the other no. you know, viruses are not going to spare you. It doesn't see. It will come back. So yeah. the public, uh, you know, service and the public health and the public hygiene becomes very critical. Mm -hmm. So they give you the data. And not only that, they track it on a daily basis, mm -hmm. you know. Because that's the way you will build the narrative. You right. know, the link is not built by saying one thing in the beginning. Yeah. And, you know, showcasing something in the end. Mm. The devil lies in that details of the in-between. Right. What happened in the in-between. What you do. Led. Have you done any harm? Yeah. Have you left out anybody? Yeah. Have you been, you know, is, has there been integrity in what you've done? Mm. And this whole in-between in the wash system mm. is a wash with, you know, what they call intermediaries mm. who talk on behalf of the community yeah. and very often are exploitative. Yeah. This data prevents all of that, prevents yeah. wastefulness, prevents, you know, 
uh, whatever usurpers you yeah. know come and usurp your mm -hmm. you know right to speak yeah. all of that and yeah. that's where and we have a public dashboard yeah which the community contributes to every week the data is updated oh wow sometimes it goes up sometimes, sometimes it goes down yeah and end of the month there's a full debate full reflection why has it gone down that is so so you take the moment to properly monitor evaluate and then again yeah. you know detailed proposals are prepared right. Budgets are created yeah. because you have data supporting yeah. you. Yeah, indeed, it's uh, backed Nobody, up. even the yeah. you know the hardcore yeah. finance man, yeah. they're always you know finding ways to say no. Yeah. They love their power to veto. But you're like, I have I have numbers for you. <laughs> What are you going to do I, now? <laughs> you know, I have it yeah. in flesh and blood. I mean, yeah. they're here to yeah. tell you. Yeah. you know, this But is not me that talking. Is, that to is them. the thing, because like the 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 example you gave eh, of like. If you would look at a slum and uh, try to, you said it, it, it defies human imagination. Defies. So nobody can speak to that experience except if you are a human being that, that, is, that is in that situation and that knows what it means to live it. Yeah. So um, given that, the, the work that you guys are doing every day to make sure that you have the numbers, that you have the data to back it up, Correct. that you look at what is the story that sort of leads from one data point to the next, how w what, you, what would you say is very specifically and concretely needed then to even furtherly bridge the gap between you know policymakers and and communities in order to make sure that we have a more inclusive approach so two things you okay. know we have two three tires of governance right and the last tire of governance is very very disempowered yeah because it's very dependent on the first and the second tire okay um it's also you know largely sort of you know um shall we say the professional experience is largely that of engineers mm. technical people because right. you, know, you have to run the city yeah and this is where we step in yeah and where you know you actually build what are called somewhat you know we can even crudely call it a shadow mm -hmm. you know kind of governance mm. where people take over take over mm. the day to day management okay. we have formed what is called community management committees okay and uh, the third tier has devolved some of the functions Yeah. to some in you know, an entity called slum development association okay but even the slum development association can you know become narrow in right. its focus because okay. there are five to eight people yeah. so they again they are you know supported by the community management committee and right. the sanitation subcommittee they are the ones who gather the data yeah. they are the ones who go house to house they are the ones who extend so all the cooperation and support sometimes you know they're laying a pipeline right. and you may have to even remove a hutment Okay, so Because that's for the first one. It's almost like covering each other's b blind spots there, yeah, right? Yeah, and ensuring that you know it's household focused. Mm -hmm. In a city, you can lose track yeah. of the micro. Right, you're so caught up in the macro. Yeah, you're so caught up in beautifying the big. Of course, yeah, and the yeah. you know obvious. Yeah, you can forget the people. Yeah, so they here they are here. You know they're like conscience keepers. Yeah, they're like you know duty bearers. Yeah, they're like you know. representatives of the people right. so they go and what we have done with them is we have uh, given representation to every group mm. so if there is a less privileged class yeah. class they have representation right. if it is an indigenous population they have representation to make sure to if there are transgenders and diverse genders they yeah. have representation yeah that's amazing so we have ensured that they speak to their constituency they bring it back yeah in the monthly meetings they raise all the issues yeah. and they take full responsibility yeah. it's not like you know you make you just generate a yeah. demand yeah you close the loop of supply you yeah. ensure that whatever comes and we have, they've also been trained to yeah. understand the technical aspects to right. understand the regulatory aspects yeah. and i i love that you say that because that's the the element that sometimes gets missed out on right that you have inclusion and representation which is amazing but then can you also properly sort of equip people with an understanding of the technicalities and everything so that they can can you know engage in the most they equitable way um we're approaching the end of the talk i mention one point yeah. they're also you know skilled plumbers masons workers they've actually built the city Yeah. So how can you, you know, yeah, trust true. or distrust yeah. their yeah. judgment? Right. They know the city. They're on the ground. Uh, thank you so much for saying that, Akila. We're approaching the 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 end of the talk show, but maybe just finally, very very briefly, if you could, what is one last main hope or takeaway you, you hope that people leave this session with? Okay. So the main takeaway, I think, is uh, what we call a human centric approach. Okay. You know, Wash has particularly suffered. from 
in excess of what we call an engineering approach. Right. So we need a social re-engineering approach. Right. You know, it's uh, ridiculous when we talk about, you know, human ingenuity. Yeah. And, you know, people can't respond to a nature's call. Right. You know, millions. So not it's not just a few numbers here and there. Yeah. yeah. You know? so, so I think solidarity, support, yeah. constantly keeping that at the center because everything it. else can be subsumed. Yeah. You know, That's the only way to, uh, the, yeah. to go yeah. from the margins to the center, the center, you would say. Thank you so much, Akila Sivadas. Thank you, thank thank you so you much for being much. here with us. Thank you for tuning in with us if you're watching from home. And to all those here in Stockholm with us, thanks for, uh, for being here. It underlines the importance of the topic. Thank you all so much. So <laughs> we are...